Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist and academic lead at PsychScene. In this video, I'm going to provide some key tips for you to help you tackle the challenge of the RANZAP MCQ exam, which consists of the extended matching questions, EMQ, and the critical appraisal paper, CAP. Having personally tackled the RANZAP exam and as the academic lead for PsychScene, I've helped over 3,000 trainees pass their exams, many of whom are consultants now. How do you begin your exam prep? What should you study? What textbooks should you read? I know these are the questions because I've been there myself. Getting through these exams is tough, no doubt, but it's really possible when the right strategy is put in place. The key is the exam isn't just about what you know, but also how you apply it. Remember at the beginning, fine, go through textbooks, but as you come sort of closer to the exam, and whilst you're reading textbooks as well, what you got to keep in mind is the buzzwords. So let's get started and let's jump straight into exploring some of these tips. So the RANZAP MCQ exam consists of two components, the extended matching questions, EMQ, and the critical analysis paper or the critical appraisal paper, CAP. So let's look at each one in more detail. Let's start off with the EMQ. Primary skill to excel in the EMQ is pattern recognition. This skill will help you answer questions correctly and rapidly, but in real life, it's about building a diagnostic or problem-solving instinct. So let's break this down with a concrete example. Let's say in the exam you encounter the term accommodation reflex. As part of preparation, accommodation reflex shouldn't just be an isolated fact in your mind. Instead, it's a cue a starting point for a series of associations. So when preparing what you're doing is you're starting out to map out the connections that arise from this word accommodation reflex. These connections go from eye movements to potential diagnoses like syphilis. Why syphilis? Because we know Argyle Robertson pupil, ARP, is linked to accommodation reflex present, also ARP, and light reflex absent. So you can see this is one constellation to keep in mind. However, one has to branch out wider in preparation, making several other connections that will be valuable in the final exam. For example, when we think about syphilis, we start thinking about subcortical dementias or subcortical neurocognitive impairments. Here we need to explore and understand the subcortical areas. These involve the basal ganglia structures, and this is again an exam question. So the key basal ganglia structures include the caudate, the putamen, the subthalamic nucleus, the globus pallidus, and the nigrostriatal pathways arising from the substantia nigra and connecting to the striatum. So let's expand this map. The substantia nigra is associated with Parkinson's disease, perhaps focusing on dopaminergic pathways, the mesolimbic, the mesocortical, the nigrostriatal, the tuber infundibular, etc. So you can see how questions can be formed on any of these different aspects. If the caudate and putamen are involved and you see this in your stem, your thoughts should pivot towards Huntington's disease. What do you need to know here? In Huntington's disease, the chromosome involved is chromosome 4. There are trinucleotide repeats, which are the CAG repeats, C-A-G. We then think about what are the other trinucleotide repeats we need to know, C-G-G in Fragile X and the constellation around Fragile X. By thinking about these different connections, we expand our horizons and we think about not necessarily a structured, single, narrow way of thinking, but random connections, which is exactly what the actual exam looks like. The questions take you through many, many different connections and the ability to spot key clues, key buzzwords is what leads to the final answer. For example, in a patient, if you come across hyperkalemia consistently in serology reports, your thought process will quickly associate it with possible endocrine disorders such as Addison's disease that might present comorbidly with psychiatric disorders. So therefore, a practical tip for exam preparation that translates effectively to clinical practice is to use, for example, post-it notes or buzzwords. Whether it's post-it notes you use or any other memory aids, the key to recognize here is buzzwords. If you're reading textbooks, focus on the key buzzwords and the associations and constellations around that buzzword. Making a list of these buzzwords and associations can allow for quick revision closer to the exam. Remember, it's not just about the buzzwords, but rather the rich web of connections 
that each one brings to life in your understanding of psychiatry. Next, let's look at the CAP component, the critical analysis paper. This is often thought of as the most daunting part, and understandably so. Statistics is not something we do on a day-to-day -day basis, or do we? You see, we might not do formal statistics, but understanding numbers and probabilities is something we do on a day-to-day -day basis in decision-making. Very, very similar principles apply when we're preparing for the exam as well. You see, the CAP component challenges you to evaluate research with a discerning eye. When faced with a study, especially when you see loads of tables with numbers, many examinees feel overwhelmed. But there's a clear strategy to appraise a paper. And practicing this strategy before the exam on a day-to-day -day basis or weekly practice can help you when it comes to the final exam. The important aspect here is in the clutter with these tables and numbers, how do we focus on what's most pertinent and most important in understanding the study's design and its implications for practice? That's really what the exam is also testing. So let's demystify this a bit more. You see in the CAP component, the questions that are asked link to appraisal of methodology. This includes understanding what kind of study it is. What sorts of peak or question is being asked? Is it an etiology question? Is it a prognostic question, a diagnostic question, or an intervention question? The most important thing to remember with a case control study is that it is always, always, always defined by the disease or the outcome. It then asks you to look deeper into understanding different biases, selection bias, measurement bias, confounding bias, and attrition bias. Now these biases do not occur in all studies uniformly. So therefore we have to understand the specific biases involved in the different study designs. They further ask you about type one error and type two error. They examine your understanding of the application of statistical tests for two groups or multiple groups, more than two groups. Understanding which tests to apply for continuous data versus categorical data. The reason why they test this is because when you're reading papers in the future, you're able to ascertain and appraise these studies in relation to their methodology. And how confident can you be in terms of applying the data and the results to your clinical practice? And that's really valuable for our patients. They will test your knowledge about statistical significance, but also see whether you're able to differentiate between statistical significance versus clinical significance. For statistical significance, the understanding of p-values and confidence intervals becomes important. And finally, they test your understanding of whether you're able to apply this study's results to clinical practice in general. So you can see that the exam follows a certain format. Of course, this is the quantitative aspect. Similarly, there is a new language to be learned for qualitative studies. You see, the best way to prepare for the CAP exam is to start off from appraising papers first. Sure, you can start off learning, reading textbooks and the key concepts. However, as you come closer to the exam, you've got to start moving towards connecting your knowledge to appraising the papers. And the best way of doing this is by printing out journal papers and then going through a structured methodological appraisal of these papers. When you come across challenging words or words that you don't understand, that's when you go back and read the concepts. This is the best way of consolidating your knowledge, but it also reflects what you will need to do in the real exam. So to summarize, by doing this, you not only prepare yourself for the exam, but also ensure that you're able to appraise papers for the future as a consultant psychiatrist. What I've gone through forms the cornerstone of PsychScene's approach to helping registrars pass their exam. And since 2009, we've helped over 3,000 registrars do just that. At PsychScene, our courses are built around these very challenges, providing you with solutions to tackle these challenges. As part of the online course, you have access to in-depth video lectures, comprehensive quizzes, and a wealth of reading material that are more than just information. They provide information not just to help you pass the exams, but also to make sure that you're learning for the real world. In the video lectures, I go through questions solve these questions just the way you would 
in the real exams. So I hope that you found these tips valuable and that you'll be able to use these to help your preparation for the exam. So with that in mind, when you feel ready to move forward, make sure you visit psychscene.com and explore all that we have to help you pave the way for a successful career in psychiatry. I wish you good luck for your exams and your future.